Greetings and welcome to Algonquin Defining Moments. This is your host, Gay Clemson, oral history author, storyteller, and lover of all things Algonquin Park. As you know, I've researched and written extensively over the last 20 years about the human history of Algonquin Park. Most of the content for this episode comes from two key sources. The first is the late Don Beaupre's 2011 book called Destination Algonquin Park, Tracks to Cache Lake in the Highland End. The second is my own Nominegan and Other Smoke Lake Jewels that was published in 2012. For more information about these as well as access to my growing catalog of related photos that might be of interest to you, check out my website, algonquinparkheritage.com. As shared in Episode 5 in the late 19th century, middle-class men in cities throughout eastern North America were turning to wilderness regions as a means of escaping urban and industrial woes and reconnecting with an idealized vision of primitive male identity in the frontier environment. Algonquin Park and its environs was one of those wilderness regions that were attractive to many. This was especially true in the late 1890s because there was now, in 1897, a railway running right through Algonquin's southern end. Initially, it was well-to-do anglers who were most able to take advantage of these opportunities. But an interest in recreation grew, and it soon became clear that there was a growing middle class who also wanted to take advantage of new recreation opportunities. For example, according to late Don Beaupre, in his book Destination Algonquin Park, in April 1896, the Huntsville Board of Trade established a commission to investigate the idea of establishing Huntsville as a tourist center, which it pretty much is today, at least in the summer. Another who was keenly interested in this new tourism phenomena was Charles Melville Hayes, the president of the Grand Trunk Railway. Now his perspective was that recreational tourism was likely to be a great way to drive passenger traffic for his railway. For those unaware, back in the mid-19th century, when railways were in their heyday, the Grand Trunk Railway, known to all as the GTR, was a major player in Canada. Though originally incorporated in 1852 through a British parent company, GTR became a going concern in 1853 as the result of an amalgamation of all kinds of smaller rail lines. Though its mission was primarily to connect Montreal to Toronto, its initial reach went from Sarnia in Ontario to Montreal through Quebec to New Brunswick. The company then built a bridge across the St. Lawrence at Montreal and from there connected to Portland, Maine, which enabled access to an ice-free port during the winter. As noted in Wikipedia, by 1880, the Grand Trunk Railway system stretched from Chicago, Illinois, to the St. Lawrence River at Montreal, and on to the Atlantic Ocean at Portland, Maine. By 1923, 125 smaller railway companies had merged into what became known as the GTR, including J.R. Booth's Ottawa, Arnprior, and Perry Sound Railway, which had earlier merged with his Canada Atlantic Railway, in 1899. Though Hayes was unable to see the results of his passion, he went down with the Titanic in 1912, he was majorly committed to building and promoting elaborate tourist hotels. All of the hotels, including the Chateau Laurier in Ottawa, Jasper Park Lodge in Jasper, Alberta, Hotel McDonald in Edmonton, Alberta, and the Fort Garry Hotel in Winnipeg, Manitoba, were part of the GTR and located next to GTR's rail lines. With Hayes' encouragement, the GTR advertised its northern rail line heavily and sponsored booths at trade shows such as Chicago's 1903 Sportsman Show. Their intent was not just to attract tourists, but also ensure that the appropriate accommodation and activities were available once that interest was piqued. On my Algonquin Park Heritage website and in many of my books are examples of GTR advertising which you can peruse at your own leisure. Of course, the advertising for Algonquin Park focused on the land's beauty, the pure and refreshing air, its possibilities as starting points for canoe trips and fishing expeditions, and of course its location at the highest point of land in Ontario with watersheds flowing in all four directions. Success in major Canadian cities encouraged Hayes to expand, and in 1905, GTR began negotiating with the Ontario government to build a resort hotel at Cache Lake. 
For some reason, one of the big issues that slowed the negotiations and made the Ontario government hesitate was the consumption of alcohol. According to Daniel Francis in his 2014 book Closing Time, each province and even towns could vote themselves dry by passing ordinances banning the retail sale of liquor. Algonquin Park, in its original charter, did so. Eventually, permission was granted by the government, but the railway had to agree that the hotels would be run on strictly temperance lines. They also had to agree that no firearms or ammunition or anything related to the trapping trade could be sold, only tourist goods, provisions, and supplies. Surprisingly enough, this prohibition against alcohol in the park generally still exists. It's okay to bring your own, but buying much commercially is restricted except for maybe beer at the Portage store. In order to hedge their bets a bit, the GTR decided to build a tent hotel in the summers of 1906 and 1907 to test their theory. As reported in the Renfrew Mercury in August 1906, the hotel included a large marquee tent that was used as a dining room and could seat between 50 and 75 people. There was a collection of individual tents on platforms that could accommodate anywhere from two to six people, complete with comfortable beds, dressers, and verandas with awnings and chairs. To no one's surprise, the tent vacations were a tremendous success, with articles extolling the fabulous fishing, accommodation, and meals appearing in magazines such as Rod and Gun and Motorsport in Canada. On July 1, 1908, the Highland Inn opened for business. It was architected along the lines of GTR's Wawa Hotel on nearby Lake of Bays, and was initially able to accommodate 50 guests. It had modern plumbing, including bathrooms with hot and cold water, though not in each room, large bright bedrooms, cozy lounging rooms with large cheery open fireplaces, acetylene gas lighting, and coal oil lamps with on-site fishing and canoe tripping outfitting. This meant that fishermen and campers didn't need to bring their own canoes, tents, cooking gear, food, or even fishing rods. Accommodation rates were $2 to $2.50 a day, or $12 to $18 a week. Dinner was $0.25. To provide some context, a postcard with a stamp cost $0.06 in those days, and an average workman's weekly salary was $12 a week. Such vacations were not inexpensive. A long wooden staircase led down the hill to the railway platform and nearby Cache Lake. Across the way was the park superintendent's residence. The first Highland Inn managers were Ed Colson and his wife Molly. Ed first came to the park from Guelph in 1905 as a park ranger and married Molly in 1907. Molly Cox Colson, a former nurse from Ottawa, had previously been the housekeeper for the park ranger boarding house. She'd first come to Cash Lake in 1900 as the guest of Cash Lake leaseholder Dr. Bell, who researched and drew the first Ontario Park canoe routes map. In my book, Algonquin Voices, you can find the details of Molly and Ed and their later life on Canoe Lake, where they managed the Algonquin Hotel and later built the Portage Store. The tent city was a success, and since demand was so strong, construction of an East Wing addition immediately began in the spring of 1909. In its early years, visitors came mostly from the United States and Ontario, with a few from Quebec and some from as far away as Australia and England. By 1910 to 1911, the Highland Inn was advertising that it could accommodate 100 guests with overflow housed in the tent city on the lawn next to the hotel. Though in its first few years it operated only from ice out to ice in, in 1912 GTR experimented with operating a winter season. To significant acclaim, tobogganing, ski jumping, snowshoeing, ice skating, and even hockey were added to the entertainment lists, along with lunch trips to cabins and shelters around Cache Lake. One GTR brochure apparently suggested hunting with a camera in the park might be a great alternative to hunting with a gun. The next year, when Camp Nabonegan opened, GTR advertised ski trips from Cache Lake to Smoke Lake. In the spring of 1912, a boathouse was constructed to support the increased demand for canoes and rowboats. Canoes were painted dark green with Highland Inn stenciled in white paint on the bow and the GTR initials burned into paddles and onto the decks of the canoes. The boathouse roof was flat with a waist-high railing and though initially used as a place for tea, it later hosted dance parties with a wind-up gramophone for records and sometimes an orchestra. 
In the 1920s, the boathouse was roofed with striped canvas curtains, which then enabled it to be used in inclement and snowy weather and for more evening activities. A hundred-foot dock was added to enable more water sport activities. Lawns were managed so that croquet, lawn bowling, and horseshoes could be played. Later, a tennis court, a mini golf course, a billiard room, a reading room were added, and the dining room was enlarged. In winter, a skating rink was created in front of the boathouse, and nearby a 500-foot toboggan slide was built that mirrored on a typical log chute. Though popular, except for 1921, the Highland Inn was generally not profitable as a standalone entity. The 1929 stock market crash depressed travel significantly, and as a result, operations were cut back, including the closing of the East Wing. Things got worse when through passenger service in the park was discontinued in late 1932. Soon after, the inn was completely shut down. During this time, the Canadian National Railway acquired the GTR, and in 1937, the CNR put the hotel property up for auction. It was sold to Charles Paget from Huntsville, along with a 13-year lease. The inn reopened for the 1938 season and was reasonably successful until the 1950s. Alas, in 1954, the Ontario government changed its policy in regards to leases in the park, and in 1955, the Pagets surrendered the property to the Ontario government. During the 1956 season, it was finally closed and demolished in the fall of 1957. All that remains today are some pieces of foundation and a set of historical plaques that were installed by the Friends of Algonquin Park in 2008. The success of the Highland Inn encouraged the GTR in 1912 to build two wilderness camps, one lodge called Camp Nominegan on Smoke Lake and the other that was called Camp Minnesing on Burnt Island Lake. Both were considered wilderness because they were about 7 and 10 miles respectively from the Highland Inn and the rail line. Nominegan, that was also known as Camp Among the Balsams, was situated on what was then called Loon Point. Loon Point was and is a strategic feature of Smoke Lake. Unlike much of the rest of the lake, Loon Point has a low sandy shoreline and though rocky is unusually flat with a rocky ridge to the east that offers protection from the prevailing northwest wind. Not only was it an ideal place for camping, but more importantly the site was also a vantage point from which the vistas of Smoke Lake could be viewed in all directions. Friends, intruders, or visitors could all be spotted while they were still far off. For guests at the Highland Inn, a visit to Loon Point was called the Grand Outing. As the late George Garland, a longtime Smoke Lake resident, shared, My aunt once told me that this day trip generally involved taking a train to Canoe Lake Station, then a boat in summer and a sleigh in winter, to Nominegan Point for lunch with the return by paddle and portage or stage or sleigh back to the Highland Inn where hot baths and an excellent dinner awaited the adventurer's return. It didn't take much to conceive of the idea of making the wilderness camping a little more comfortable by adding soft beds and solid cabins, hot and cold running water, acetylene lights, good meals, warm fireplaces when it got chilly, and a launch for sightseers who wanted more comfortable travel than by canoe. According to Bud Callahan, who was the Smoke Lake Park Ranger at the time, the 10-acre site was selected by Superintendent Bartlett along with various Grand Trunk Railway officials and cleared over the summer of 1912. The buildings were patterned along the lines of those common to the Adirondack Forest in the northeastern United States. Research conducted by John Ebbs, the son of a later owner, suggested that Nominegan's initial construction began in the winter when the huge cedar logs that were needed could be hauled to the site without damage, for no vehicle could carry them. They were between 30 and 40 feet in length, perfectly straight, and 2 feet in diameter. Several hundred of these timbers were needed for the main house and the six smaller guest houses. The cedar logs in some instances came from as far away as 40 miles. Men and supplies had to be moved by wagon over miles of rough road. Hardwood flooring to cover all of its floors had to come by rail and then by tote road. Teams of horses had to haul each log up a ramp to its resting place atop the one below. Each one was painstakingly matched to fit with the others and dovetailed to form a mortised joint at the corners. The natural bark of the cedar formed a weather-resistant siding on the outside and a functional wall on the inside. 
The cracks between each log were caulked and plastered and window casements set in holes cut in the sturdy walls. The completed two-story buildings had a pleasantly rugged look. The main floor contained the kitchen and pantry, dining room, living room, games rooms, and an office, bedroom and bathroom for the manager. Above the kitchen area were six rooms for the hired help. There were ten separate guest rooms and three more bathrooms, complete with huge tubs. A magnificent natural stone chimney, the only source of heat, provided an outlet for two fireplaces, which divided the front section of the lodge into the dining and living rooms, each of which were 30 feet in length and 24 feet in width. A covered wide veranda went across the front, which was a talking place for guests. Even with several Quebec heaters, when a cold west wind blew in the spring and fall, it could at times be frightfully cold. The front door, which opened onto a rotunda, contained a piano, a desk, a number of rustic chairs, a table, water cooler and clock, and a set of stairs that led to the second floor. In the northwest corner was a registration desk at which postcards and candy bars could be purchased. On the ground floor was an office, then a passageway off of which there was a bathroom and three bedrooms. Under the stairs there was a cupboard for storing wood for the fireplace. Leading off from the rotunda was a dining room with tables and chairs to accommodate approximately 50 people. Leading from the dining room was a small pantry for dishes equipped with a sink with hot and cold water. The kitchen adjoined the pantry and contained a huge wood-burning range and two cupboards for crockery and pans. The stairway to the staff bedrooms and two bathrooms led from the kitchen. Over the dining room and rotunda were ten guest bedrooms and two bathrooms with paper-thin partitions. All of the bedrooms contained beds, bureaus, and chairs, as well as beautiful buttercup yellow porcelain wash bowls and pitchers. All the windows were fitted with screens, and the general exposure was to the south. The entire building was only about 30 feet from the water's edge, and the whole establishment, including the main building and the cabins, was lit by acetylene piped in from a storage tank located near the guidehouse. On a ridge to the east of the main lodge was where the six cabins were built. Each could accommodate eight to ten people, with a ground floor living room, veranda, and massive stone fireplace. A spiral stairway led to the second floor balconies, off of which were two bedrooms and a three-piece bath. In the bay to the east was a boathouse that held canoes and rowboats and a launch. Laundry was done by the Chateau Laurier Hotel in Ottawa and sent there by train twice a week. At capacity, Nominegan could host nearly a hundred people, including sixty to seventy guests, a manageress, a chief mechanic, six cabin girls, a cook, a porter, four dining room girls, assistants, a teamster, and the guides. Located adjacent to the kitchen was a staff dining room, a storeroom, and a washroom. Close to the kitchen was an ice house that held 400 to 500 blocks of ice and was built with two storerooms at the main entrance. The storerooms housed all of the perishable supplies, such as meat, vegetables, and milk, that were brought in by stage along the tote road, or by paddle and portage from the Highland Inn or from Canoe Lake by portage to Smoke Lake. Later, one of the park rangers tore down a beaver dam that blocked Smoke Creek, which then enabled boat launches to make their way through to Canoe Lake Station and avoid the canoe to Smoke Lake portage. Also on the property was a log guidehouse that contained a large assembly room with a fireplace, a bunk room, and a veranda. A hundred yards away from the main lodge was a stable that accommodated two cows at one end and a team of horses in the center with recess for a stagecoach. Over the stable was a loft for hay and oats. Nearby was a pump house with a water pump connected to a huge water tank that enabled indoor plumbing in all of the bedrooms in the kitchen. Camp Nominegan officially opened for guests after the ice went out in the spring of 1913. Between the kitchen and the dining room was a pantry where the trays were made up and carried to the tables in the immaculate dining room. There were white tablecloths and linen napkins and on each table were beautiful bouquets made from the wildflowers, leaves and mosses growing around the property. It was an attractive room indeed, but as it was only 24 by 30 feet, in the high season four sittings were often required and reservations by outsiders had to be made well in advance. The original china was white with GTR marked in green letters and was very heavy, as each guest was supplied with a dinner plate, a side plate, vegetable dishes, butter dish, teapot, dessert bowl, and cream jug, the arms of the dining girls must have been very sturdy indeed. When the GTR was taken over by the CNR, new china was obtained and the original settings became collector's pieces. 
The new china had a high gloss finish with beautiful emblems in gold of a maple leaf and the letter CNR. It was pretty posh for the wilderness. The meals were excellent. Breakfast consisted of grapefruit, oatmeal, or whole wheat porridge, or cream of wheat, cold cereal, usually cornflakes, bacon and eggs, any way you wanted them. For dinner, there was always a choice of three main dishes, roast pork, lamb, beef, or chicken, potatoes, vegetables, dessert, usually pies or puddings. Occasionally, ice cream was made by one of the caretakers using a hand churn. There were no salads, but there were dishes of radishes, onions, olives, and pickles. Lettuce was used mostly for decoration for platters of cold meat or deviled eggs. But fish, usually trout or bass, there were lots of, especially that which was caught by the guests and served to the glory of the catchers. By the mid-1920s, Nominegan had become a favorite lodging spot for families who would come and stay often for two months, year after year. Accommodations cost two fifty per day or sixteen to eighteen dollars per week. To get there, guests would disembark the train at Algonquin Park Station at Cache Lake. From there, they would be driven by a horse-drawn taxi called a Democrat over the seven-mile rough road, partly built with logs arranged in a corduroy fashion that ran along the Source Lake Road for part of the journey. The road was about 12 feet wide with damp spots filled in with hollow logs and very rough. According to a 1977 interview with Tom Murdoch, a stagecoach driver at the Highland Inn in the early 1920s, there were three stagecoaches at the Highland Inn, a company team, and two hired teams. The company team usually stayed at the Highland Inn, and the other two teams, usually with three or four guests, went to Nominegan and Minasing every day, loaded with supplies going in and returning the next day. The stagecoach had three seats and could hold six passengers with a driver. On busy days, the company team would also be put into service to help ferry guests for a dollar each way. They'd leave the Highland Inn around 2.30 p.m. after the train had arrived, and it would take four hours to get there, so they would arrive around 6 p.m. in the evening. The driver and the team would stay overnight and leave the next morning right after breakfast around 8 or 8.30. So what did the guests do to keep themselves busy? The main activity for the men was fishing. In 1923, an Ontario resident fishing license cost $3 and was $5 for a non-resident. Fishing trips were quite the expedition. According to Mary Northway, sometimes as many as 30 people in 10 canoes, including 10 guides and 20 guests, would head out to nearby prime fishing spots on Ragged, Heligone, or Porcupine Lakes. The guides portaged the canoes and carried the food packs, and it is said that one was assigned to carry the pack of liquid refreshments. Few would publicly say what those liquid refreshments were since alcohol was forbidden in the park. A collection of guides who allegedly knew the locations of all prized fishing spots worked for the major lodges. All summer long, they would take various parties on multi-day or week-long fishing trips throughout the park. There was also extensive airplane traffic as anglers would arrange to be flown in and out of distant lakes. Another common fishing expedition was a two-week trip from Nominegan through Canoe Lake, then north to Petawawa River, which would then carry them east to the town of Pembroke. From Pembroke, the group would load the canoes on the train and return to the Highland Inn. As one visitor advised the park superintendent, my fishing club is going to Nominegan. The guides have come to look upon their two weeks of work with us as prerequisite, and we are anxious to give them this work this spring. This year, there'll be 11 guides, three of whom will have regular park licenses. For the other eight, the club will be paying for their licenses. When they weren't fishing, guests would play cards, talk, or go out for a walk in the woods, or a canoe ride, or go swimming in bathing suits that covered the guests from head to toe. According to Aubrey Dunn, who was a fire ranger stationed at Smoke Lake from 1924 to 1927, there were square dances in the guide house nearly every night. If it were raining, the men would gather in the cabins and play poker, according to one source. The ladies would gather in the lodge and partake in games of bridge or write poetry. Like all locales in the wilderness, Nominegan did have its share of accidents, near drownings, gallant rescues, and other mishaps. Young male guests would get lost in the mist in the way back to the campsite after a dance, and search parties would have to go out with flashlights to try to find them. According to George and Willa May, who were on staff for many years, the most heart-stopping thing that happened was the summer when a family by the name of Clark came to stay. Mrs. Clark was pregnant and started to go into labor at 2 o'clock in the morning, whilst Mr. Clark was up on Crown Lake on a fishing trip. 
So George got a canoe and took the launch up to the end of Smoke Lake, paddled up Ragged Lake, and walked over to Crown, where he could call Clark from the portage. They got back to camp later that morning by around 8 o'clock, and in the meantime, Willamay found that there were two girls visiting, one of which was trained as a nurse. Their father, who was an official on the railway, was called on the phone, and through him arrangements were made to have a doctor brought up by train from St. Catharines. The doctor arrived with his own special nurse and delivered the baby on an operating table constructed out of an old door which Willa covered with sheets and blankets. The new baby boy was named Nominegan Clark, though whatever happened to him was never known. After Taylor Staten established Camp Omic for boys in 1921 and Camp Wapameo for girls in 1924, Nominegan also became summer lodging for parents of campers and a meeting place for camp counselors on their day off. This was a tradition that lasted for decades until Nominegan was taken down in the late 1970s. Unfortunately, though popular, Nominegan was also not profitable, which is of concern to GTR and later to its CNR owners. In the spring of 1927 or 28, a fire destroyed the six cabins due to a suspected blockage in the settling system. The cabins were not rebuilt, and soon after the hotel was shut down. It remained empty until 1931 when Garfield Northway, owner of Northway department stores from Toronto, bought the buildings and assumed the lease. For more details of the Northway's Nominegan experience, you'll have to check out my book Nominegan and Other Smoke Lake Jewels, which can be found at the Friends of Algonquin Bookstore or on their website or on Amazon or other online book retailers. Northway died in 1960 and passed along the lease to Adele and Harry Ebbs in 1962. Adele, known to all as Coochie, was the camp director of Camp Wapameo. In August 1969, a plaque was placed at the Nominegan site to commemorate the Northway's contributions and recognize the 57 years during which Nominegan had been a landmark of the park. The Ebbs would regularly move at the end of August from Little Wapameo Island on Canoe Lake to take up residence at Nominegan. There they would fish, swim, and sail and relax with friends well into the fall. From time to time, old friends from the GTR, CNR days who had frequented Nominegan in the 1920s would hold reunions, reliving their experiences of 40-plus years ago. In 1976, the Nominegan lease expired. Extensive discussions and lobbying occurred at very high levels of the Ontario government to get it renewed, but to no avail. At one point, the Ontario Heritage Foundation got involved, but in the end, its Architectural Conservation Committee expressed great regret that the historical and architectural significance of Nominegan could not be adequately recognized within the terms of the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources policy with respect to buildings in the park. They couldn't justify the cost of removing the building from the park and reassembling it somewhere else. In addition, there was much dissent from park residents anxious to protect and preserve a local landmark. As one wrote in great distress, Nominegan is a landmark of the park and part of its heritage. To destroy such a unique building is as wanton an act as to burn an early sketch of Tom Thompson's simply because it no longer fit the style of the times. Alas, none of the appeals were successful, and in 1977, Dr. Ebbs was authorized to salvage whatever he wanted before the Crown began demolition. Robert Bowes, then a director of the Historical Planning and Research Branch of the Ministry of Culture and Recreation, allegedly documented complete information on the architecture, condition, location, and construction techniques concerning the site and its buildings, but none of these documents have ever been found. Knowing that it was a building of some historical significance, the park officials did take pains to photograph the building as it was being taken down, and these can be found in the Park Archives photo collection. According to local legend, Dr. Ebbs couldn't bear to see the main lodge demolished, so he sold the logs to the director of nearby Camp Candelor with the plan to reassemble it at the Camp Candelor site. It was dismantled piece by piece with each log numbered and then moved to the landing by barge in the fall of 1977. The logs were taken to Camp Candelor but never rebuilt, and those magnificent pine logs eventually all rotted away. Like its twin, Minasing was also considered a remote wilderness camp. It was accessible either by open wagon over 11 miles on a very rough road or by canoe from Joe Lake Station, which required hiring a guide and renting a canoe. 
Minasing was also a popular spot for launching fishing expeditions into the park interior. Like Namanegan, Camp Minasing had a main lodge with 10 guest rooms, two bathrooms, a kitchen, dining room, and living room, as well as several cabins. Total guest capacity was 68. According to the daughter of a later owner, Mary Sessions Klein and a 1947 brochure, each cabin had a two-story high living room with a large natural stone fireplace, two bedrooms on each side of the fireplace, another two bedrooms upstairs, and a porch that ran three-quarters of the way around the front. It was furnished with split hickory rockers and armchairs, and each could accommodate up to eight people. A staff quarters and a guide shack were located at the back of the lodge, and a high water tower supplied pressurized water to all the buildings and lighting was provided by acetylene gas lamps. Also like Nominegan, there were canoes, a sailboat, and several rowboats with access to great fishing at nearby lakes, including Lake Lemure, Big Trout Lake, Happy Isle, and Merchant Lakes. For a dozen or so years, Minasing was a success, but like Nominegan and the Highland Inn before it, in the end it wasn't profitable either. In 1925, it was sold to Dr. Henry Sharman, a retired California scientist who used the property as a Christian school. According to Audrey Saunders' History of Algonquin Park, Sharman was a very religious man and would hold seminars there to study the life of Jesus. As George Garland, who canoe tripped extensively with the Camp Omic in the 1930s, remembered, often we would run into groups from this camp out on some of the Burnt Island Lake campsites, where they would be singing hymns or sitting in a circle reading their scriptures. We used to look at them with some mild amusement. They seemed to mix their experience with paddling and fishing and sailing with a quite serious study of religious matters. Sharman ran his retreats there until 1946, when he sold Minasing with the lease to Manly Sessions. Sessions had been a leaseholder on Smoke Lake since 1936. When Sessions heard that Minasing was for sale, he was so enthusiastic at the possibility of purchasing it that he immediately drove to California to meet with Sharman at his home in Carmel. He brought along references and letters to illustrate his good character and eventually convinced Sharman that he would manage the resort on Christian principles. In January of 1947, the Ontario Department of Lands and Forests approved the transfer of the property and the lease, and it reopened as a lodge in the summer of 1947. Sessions ran menacing for six years, but the 1954 change in park policy concerning leases doomed the operation as the government wouldn't renew the lease. Apparently, they were concerned because it was so much deeper in the park interior than all of the other camps and lodges. So Sessions had no choice but to sell the property back to the Crown, which he did in 1956. It was dismantled soon after. The Menacing Road was abandoned except for use by loggers until the 1990s when part of it was reopened as a biking trail. Visiting both sites today is an odd experience. On Burnt Island Lake, the forest has completely encroached such that its topography is hardly recognizable. It's not until you stumble across the remains of the guidehouse fireplace that you realize where you are. With careful inspection, especially in the fall when the leaves have fallen, sometimes ancient artifacts can be found littering the site from old tin cans to rusting bed springs, as well as the occasional pot. Paddling along the shore reveals the remains of what look like some sort of water pump system, but no signs exist of the foundations where the main lodge and cabins must have once sat. On Smoke Lake's Loon Point, it's now completely overgrown with bushes and trees. Though the plaque is still there, along with a few stones, nothing can be seen of what was once the magnificent Nominegan Garden, an open space where the lodge once stood. So I hope you've enjoyed this quick look down memory lane of three unique lodges that represented a time when the railway was king. For further details, as I've indicated previously, my book Nominegan and Other Smoke Lake Jewels can tell you about Nominegan during its heyday as the social center of Smoke Lake during the Northway period. For a greater understanding of the Highland Inn and Cache Lake, you can check out Don Beaupre's book, Destination Algonquin Park, or you can take a walk at the Cache Lake Landing and see the historic storyboards that the Friends of Algonquin Park have erected there. As I mentioned previously, I've also posted on my Algonquin Park Heritage website a collection of photos of Nominegan and a few that I have of Minasing and the Highland Inn. I've also created a video of this podcast, which is available on my Algonquin Park Heritage YouTube channel. 
In the next episode, I'm going to talk about what canoe tripping was like in the early 19th century. It's a completely different experience than what we do today. Thank you.